Hi and welcome back food lovers. So you're off to visit Ireland for a few days. Congratulations as it's a country steeped in tradition and mysticism and the roaming countryside is never more than half an hour away from big cities such as Dublin and Cork. But what are you going to eat while you're there? Of course you can go to the tried and tested fast food joints found all over the world but if you want to try something traditional I've compiled a list of 11 foods that you must eat while you're there. I say 11 but number 11 is optional so hang around until the end to find out what it is. So without further ado let's begin our list. The first on our list are langoustines. Ireland being an island means that it's surrounded by water and the Irish Sea is one of the cleanest seas in the world. This means that it produces some of the best seafood in the world and the langoustine is right there on the list. In Ireland they are also known as Dublin Bay prawns and they look like miniature lobsters to which they are related. The best way to eat these is to have them cooked simply either boiled and dipped in butter or cooked under a grill. Once a year around St Patrick's Day in March they hold a festival in Dublin called the Dublin Bay Prawn Festival where they celebrate the langoustine. The festival is situated in Hoth which is an area of Dublin by the sea. It's well worth visiting the festival if you're around at that time as there are many stalls selling dishes made from the langoustine like this stall selling paella. Number two on our list is black and white pudding. These are two different types of sausages and are usually eaten at breakfast time but can also be eaten at other times of the day. Black pudding is a type of sausage made from blood, meat, fat, oatmeal, seasoning and a filler such as breadcrumbs. Traditional Irish black pudding is called rasheen and is usually made with sheep's blood, milk, salt, breadcrumbs, mutton suet and stuffed into a sheep's intestine. White pudding is also a type of sausage like black pudding but without the blood. Instead other ingredients are substituted for the blood, usually suet or liver. Black and white pudding is served by slicing and frying and is usually eaten as part of an Irish breakfast. The other constituents of an Irish breakfast also include fried eggs, mushrooms, bacon to which the Irish refer to colloquially as rashers, sausages and baked beans. A favourite brand of black and white pudding in Ireland is Clonakilty. I personally think that there are nicer brands available. If there are any connoisseurs of black pudding out there, let me know what your favourite brand is. At three we have Ireland's most famous beverage and that is of course the beer Guinness. Although Guinness is available all around the world, you cannot claim to have visited Ireland without having drunk a pint in the country where it was created. This drink was first brewed by Arthur Guinness in the late 1700s and it became popular with train porters or the people that load bags onto trains. That's why it was originally called porter stout, stout meaning strong or full bodied. In fact the alleged health properties of Guinness was used as an advertising tool right into the 1920s when they ran an advertising campaign claiming that Guinness is good for you. It was even given to patients after an operation. Guinness today make no such health claims and you can get yourself a pint of the stout at the very place where it is brewed at the St James's Gate Brewery in Dublin. They have a visitor centre there called the Guinness Storehouse which is well worth a visit as they guide you through the production process with interactive displays. The culmination of the visit is a complimentary pint of Guinness served in the gravity bar in which you can experience 360 degree views of the city. I'd previously mentioned that Ireland has some of the best seafood in the world and so at four we have another item which is the oyster. In fact there is evidence that the Irish people have been eating oysters as far back as 8,000 years ago due to the discovery of discarded oyster shell beds in archaeological digs. Back in history though the oyster was seen more as a basic food item rather than as a luxury food as it is today. It even helped populations living along the coast to survive the two famines which affected potato crops. Today though the oyster is eaten out of pleasure rather than as a necessity and is a celebrated part of Irish cuisine. Oysters can be eaten cooked or raw but it's usually eaten raw straight out of the half shell. The season for oysters starts in September and this is the month in which the Galway Oyster Festival is held annually. 
This event is held during the last weekend of September and provides those who visit with a great opportunity to sample all the different varieties of native oysters. If there's one Irish dish that everyone will have heard of, it's Irish stew, and this is what we have at number 5. This dish has humble beginnings, and the earliest recipes for it dates back to the 16th century when the potato was first introduced to Ireland. The meat used in this dish would originally have been mutton rather than lamb or beef as used today. This is because families would have kept sheep into old age as they used them for their wool and milk. Only when the sheep came to the end of its useful life would it have been slaughtered for its meat. Thus the method of stewing, which is long and slow, was used to cook the meat to make it tender and palatable. Original recipes would have used only two other vegetables added to the mutton, namely onion and potato. Only if families were lucky to get hold of other root vegetables, such as carrot and turnip, would it have been added to the dish. If you want to experience Irish stew for yourself, the best place would be in a pub. One pub that I'd recommend would be the Brazen Head in Dublin, which claims to be the island's oldest pub and serves an excellent version of the dish. At six, we have a dish that dates back to the 18th century and is still eaten today in many Irish homes, but is particularly popular in the city of Dublin. This dish is called Coddle, and it was allegedly a favorite dish of Jonathan Swift, who wrote Gulliver's Travels, and also has a mention in the book Dubliners, written by James Joyce. The word coddle is a verb describing a method of cooking food in water at a temperature below boiling point. Although there isn't a definitive recipe, the main ingredients added to the water are potatoes, sausages, bacon and onions. The only seasonings used are salt and pepper, and perhaps some chopped parsley. The low and slow method of cooking produces a flavorful dish, as the meat and vegetables become very tender. Traditionally, this dish is cooked in Irish homes on a Thursday as a method of using up any spare sausages and bacon in the kitchen, as Catholics are not supposed to eat meat on a Friday. At 7 we have bacon and cabbage. This is a dish traditionally eaten on St Patrick's Day, but it's also popular enough to be eaten all year round. The dish consists of a piece of back bacon boiled with cabbage and potatoes. This is a one pot dish, so the cabbage would be cooked in the same liquid as the bacon, which would infuse some of its flavor onto the cabbage. The bacon is served sliced with the cabbage and potatoes, often accompanied by white bechamel sauce flavored with parsley. The best place to try bacon and cabbage is in an Irish person's house cooked by their mother or mammy to use the colloquial term. So if you're lucky enough to be invited around for dinner, be sure to drop some subtle hints that you'd like to have some bacon and cabbage. At 8 we have a historical food that dates back to famine times. These are Irish potato pancakes called box tea. The name is believed to be derived from the Gaelic Aran Bok Tea, meaning poor house bread. Don't worry, it's far more appetizing than that suggests. There are three different types of box tea. Pan box tea, loaf box tea, and boiled box tea, each named after their method of cooking. Despite that, they contain essentially the same ingredients, which are potatoes, flour, and a pinch of salt. The most popular is pan box tea, in which the cakes are fried in a pan and served straight away. This dish is celebrated in the folk rhyme, which my daughter will now read aloud. Take it away, Maya. Box tea on the griddle, box tea in the pan. If you can't make box tea, you'll never get your man. It's estimated that by the late 1700s, an average Irish family of two adults and four children ate five tons of potatoes a year. So with that, cooks had to get inventive and create new recipes for using the potato. The box tea is definitely one of the more delicious creations. However, it has only been recently when it has started making an appearance again on restaurant menus as the Irish have become more interested in their own cuisine as this would have been considered a peasant dish even up until 10 years ago. At nine, I've added something a bit left field to the list, but it's definitely become a mainstay of Irish cuisine, even though it was invented less than 10 years ago, and that is the spice bag. A spice bag is a fast food item that's sold in Asian takeaways that consists of potato chips, fried crispy chicken strips or chicken balls, green and red peppers, 
fried onions and chilies. This mixture is then placed into a paper bag onto which a unique mixture of Asian spices that includes Chinese five spice powder and Szechuan peppercorn powder is sprinkled. The bag is then closed and shaken to ensure that the spices coat the fried items evenly. What this dish shows us is Ireland's evolving tastes and food culture as the Irish are not well known for being adventurous eaters. Nobody currently knows who invented the dish but its popularity has spread like wildfire throughout Ireland led by the millennial generation and has become Ireland's adopted national dish. If you want to try this dish then you can find it in many Chinese or Asian takeaways. At number 10 we have a delicious Irish breakfast cereal consisting of pieces of toasted oat shapes mixed with pieces of multicolored marshmallow shapes. The cereal is called Lucky Charms. Uh, Dad, Lucky Charms are Irish. Ah, oh, drat. I suppose I better come up with something else for number 10. I know, I've got one. Finally, at number 10 we have a great Irish comfort food that you must try when you come to Ireland and that is Shepherd's Pie. The history of Shepherd's Pie dates back to around 1791 and it was believed to have been created by frugal housewives looking to create a use for leftover meat and potatoes. The meat used in this dish dictates its name, so when lamb is used it's called shepherd's pie but when beef is used instead it's called cottage pie. The meat is cooked in a gravy with perhaps some vegetables such as onions and peas and topped with mashed potatoes. You'll find this dish on the menus of many pubs in Ireland. One pub that's reported to serve a great version of this dish is a historic pub called John Cavanagh's in Dublin. This pub is situated opposite the city's largest cemetery called Glasnevin Cemetery. Due to this, the pub has come to be known locally as the Gravediggers as it was frequented both by mourners and gravediggers after a shift. So that was the list of 10 foods that you must eat or drink in Ireland, but I did promise you an extra one that was optional. So at number 11 we have our final Irish dish and these are boiled pickled pig's feet known as crubines. Crubines became widely available in Ireland when bacon factories in Cork, Dublin, Waterford and Belfast began operating in the late 1800s. Big pots of crubines were boiled up and served in pubs on a Saturday night. As these pig's feet were salted it caused the diners to also drink more beer from the pub. In the original recipe the crubines would have been simply cooked by boiling them in water with an onion, a carrot, a sprig of thyme and sage until they were tender and then served with brown bread. Modern restaurants now serving this dish though have modified the recipe to elevate the dish's status. If you see it in the menu on the restaurant in Ireland be sure to order it and let me know how it tastes. So that's it for now guys thanks for watching and be sure to subscribe and like and see you next time.